everybody can see my screen, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Gabriella Shirky. I'm really excited to be uh, welcoming you all here today to the pilot's uh, first of four webinar series titled non our Non-Academic Career Transition Webinar Series. This webinar is titled to uh, develop your career metrics, values, skills, and interests that filter your non-academic career search. Uh, this webinar series is brought to you by the Michigan Department of Agricultural and Rural Development, the Michigan State Graduate School, our College of Arts and Letters Citizen Scholars Program, the College of Social Science, and the College of Natural Science. So again, welcome everybody. We're excited to have you. We're going to launch a quick poll, and we would appreciate it if you could just take a quick minute, figure out, uh, fill out, uh, to see who's here in the room with us. Okay, and I'll go ahead and continue. Introducing a little bit about the pilot program while you go ahead and finish up that poll. So our project coordinators, it takes a big team to pull off something like this. Uh, we're really excited to have a all hands on deck here, um, including myself. You have NUIU, who's here hosting a webinar with me. Uh, we have our MSU supervisor, Dr. Julie Rajewski, who we're very grateful for, as well as our MDAR collaborators, Ashley Bettine and Kaylee Shoemaker. Uh, thank you for helping us pull together the programming. Additionally, we acknowledge the significant development and the early stages of this program contributed by Ken Leah Pebbles, who is a PhD candidate in writing, rhetoric, and American cultures, also known as the RAP program. Uh, Kayleen Shoemaker, also pictured above and joining us today, communications representative for the Animal Industry Division, MDAR, and a former faculty member in RAP, as well as Dr. Tara Rayel, who earned her PhD in African history at Michigan State University in 2020. Thank you, everybody. Uh, the pilot program bridges the gap between graduating students and non-academic professionals. We empower students as they prepare for the non-academic job market. We seek to create positive social change across higher education, communities, governments, and organizations through a framework adopted from the four R's indigenous approach, including respect, relevance, reciprocity, and responsibility. In our program, we explore the four stages of the non-academic career transition process developed from beyond the professorate, which include discover, research, implement, and build. And we exchange DEI training and material with MDAR professionals. You can visit our website to learn more about us, as seen here, grad.msu.edu slash pilot project. In the first half of our series, uh, which is what you're joining us here today, is the career development webinar and also our summer 2022 cohort. We explore the four stages of the non-academic career process, the first of which we'll be talking about today. That's the discover step where we're going to develop our career metric together, discuss value, skills, and interests for your non-academic search. In the research stage, we'll apply that metric so that you can identify and attract a non-academic opportunity. In the implement stage, we'll be putting our research to practice. This is when you're going to be conducting your job search and building that non-academic career. In the build stage, we'll specifically be navigating the non-academic transition process as a whole and envisioning our long-term career development. Think of it as what do you do once you get your non-academic job. On the other half of our series, we have DEI training for MDARD and our 2022 cohort that's joining us. Uh, the idea is that we will seed the rippling effect for positive social changes. You can see what looks like a seed here. And on this little white circle, we have our immediate actions of talking about academic skills, our research, creativity, and overall humanity. This spills into our MDARD MSU DEI events, uh, which is part of our reciprocal approach. And continuing the ripple effect, we'll be influencing MDARD's institutional culture, as well as our MSU graduates off-campus influence, ultimately allowing our participants to carry forth their influence um, and their engagements to come. We're very grateful for our Michigan State uh, participants who are serving as DEI guest speakers. That includes Dr. Julie Leiberkin, Dr. Amy Swenson Buckley and Dr. Luis Alonso Garcia. If you want to learn more, again, you can find that information on our website below. Okay, so we can go ahead and end the poll. Uh, thank you again for filling out uh, all the questions there. We can share the results here and see what do we have. So it looks like 19 out of 19 people answered. Um, we have mostly graduate students here. 79% of you are graduate students. The other 21% are recent grads. So we have some uh, uh, advanced academics here. What year are we in? We are leaning a little bit more towards the third and the fourth year. So I like to see that people are getting ready. 
a couple of fifth and six years. I'm one of those. Good to see you. Um, we have folks that are saying they are in the discover and the research stage mostly. Um, a few that are in the implement stage. And thank you for, yeah, thank you for answering the listserv. We're happy to have you. All right, without that, I'll go ahead and introduce our guest speaker here. Uh, again, this webinar is titled Develop Your Career Metric. We're welcoming Kayleen Shoemaker back from our panel on June 22nd. That was really great. Kayleen's joining us with 13 years of teaching experience from three different Michigan universities. At present, she is the communications representative for MDARD's animal industry, and she supports media and outreach for MDARD's executive communication team and DEI efforts. Uh, just a quick overview of the webinar for participants. We're going to have a 30-minute presentation followed by Q&A. Please enter your questions in the Q&A box at any time. And then we'll be ending the webinar at 3.45. A recording will be available on our project website within a week. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Kaylee. As soon as I stop sharing my screen. All right, take it away. So thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I am just going to make sure to navigate over and share my screen. Oop. All right, can everyone see that? Are we good? Looks great. All right. <laughs> Sounds good to me. So um, thank you everyone for uh, your interest here today and uh, stopping in to listen to our webinar. Um, so for this, for my presentation, I'm pretty much just going to focus on my job journey and essentially how I got from that academic side of things to now the non-academic side of things and just focusing on some of, you know, those, you know, key moments, key reflections, you know, key things I learned along that process. And, um, you know, hopefully you can, um, you know, pick up some interesting, you know, tips and advice um, and insights from that. So to begin where it all began, <laughs> essentially. So in my, um, you know, when I was deciding on what exactly I wanted to do for, you know, a career and what I wanted to do. Um, I just really wanted to teach. There was something that just drew me to the field. Um, I liked helping people and explaining things in a way that people could, you know, understand clearly and, you know, be able to improve on, you know, their own work and, you know, to improve on their own understanding and, you know, to use that to, you know, propel them forward. It's like you felt like you made a really big impact. And I really like that aspect. So um, I went to Saginaw Valley and got my teaching degree in uh, English education. And my original intent was to go into secondary education and, you know, teach in that, you know, high school, middle school type realm. Um, but the job market wasn't great <laughs> when I graduated. So I had to, you know, kind of quickly find, you know, a different path or, you know, a different way to, you know, build that teaching experience and, you um, you know, to really, you know, just find a way to use and build those skills. So maybe it would be easier for me in the future, um, you know, to actually get a job in that secondary education realm. Um, so I ended up uh, being able to secure a graduate assistantship at CMU. And um, in that role, I both um, taught classes as well as took classes. Um, so, you know, you're kind of being the student and the teacher at the same time. So, you know, it really helped to, you know, develop a lot of key skills in terms of, you know, not only teaching, but also, you know, managing, you know, your time and all that other sort of stuff, too. So um, learned a lot through that whole experience. Um, and after graduating from CMU, um, again, I tried to get 
Um, and I did apply for, you know, some jobs in that secondary education field, but I found it very difficult to kind of break into at the time, which, you know, upon reflection now it's kind of like, ha ha, you can kind of have like, you know, you, the, the selection process. I mean, you know, not like, uh, you know, there, there just seems to be many more opportunities, um, because of, uh, you know, unique circumstances and you know we just um you know there there's a lot more going on there but at the time there were a lot of experienced teachers that you know wanted to move to different districts so I kept being beaten out by people who had five years experience and it's like well I can't quite compete with that um but I was able to begin teaching as an adjunct and fixed term faculty um and I had um, some classes that I, that I was able to get at SVSU as well as CMU. Um, and I was, you know, teaching at both places at the same time to try to piece together like a whole schedule. Um, so it was kind of challenging at first, but at the very least, you know, I was getting that experience and building my skill sets. And, um, you know, I really kind of began in, you know, the university side of things just out of necessity. And, um, you know, it was what exactly, you know, I could, you know, get. And, um, you know, it was all beneficial um, at the time. And, um, you know, as I continued to work more in that university environment, um, I found that there were a lot of advantages to that ad environment compared to like maybe what you would encounter in a secondary education classroom, because instead of, you know, having, you know, five to seven classes that you had to manage, you know, with all the students, you had maybe three to four, depending on what university that you, you know, were at and, you know, the terms of, you um, you know, your, your contracts. And, um, you know, the students on the, you know, university side of things, they were adults, so you didn't have to deal with parents. Um, so it, it was funny when I was doing my student teaching as part of getting my English education degree, um, I was talking to a few staff members, you know, where I was doing my student teaching, and they're like, yep, I define my career by how many less parent teacher conferences that I have to do. Um, so it was a pretty, you know, uh, eye opening experience there. And, you know, it, it was certainly, you know, much easier to deal, you know, directly with the students um, and talk to them one on one. Um, and also there were more flexible hours, um, you know, uh, starting out, you kind of just got whatever, you know, was left over and whatever was still open. But, you know, if you were at a university for a period of time, you know, you had a little bit more control and, um, you know, you could at least, you know, pick which days of the week that you wanted to be on campus or, um, you know, you, you know, didn't have to take like any class, you know, after seven o'clock at night or, you know, whatever the case is. So there, there was a little bit more control there. Um, and flexibility. And also there was more autonomy too, because you didn't have, you know, standardized testing um, or, you know, review by principals or, you know, anything like that. So, um, you know, being at that university level was quite, you know, attractive. And, you know, that's, you know, why I stayed in. Um, I was eventually able to get a full-time fixed-term position at CMU. Um, and, you know, like my contracts to start with were maybe like one year, but then they grew to two year and I actually got like a, a three year uh, once or twice, I can't quite remember, but, um, you know, that just meant a little bit more stability. Um, so that was always welcome. And then, of course, you know, I was able to, you know, get my position at MSU a little bit later on as well. Um, but even though, you know, there were a lot of positives to this university track and exactly what I was doing, and, you know, I, I liked you know, teaching and working with students and all that sort of good stuff, um, there were some drawbacks. So um, again, 
I work for the animal industry division, so you're going to get some animals today. So they punctuate my life now. So I figured um, it would be good to punctuate um, some aspects of the presentation here with them as well. So here are some kittens from one of our registered shelters in Michigan. But um, when it came to that, again, that university side of things, there were just, you know, some drawbacks. And as time went on, these, you know, had you know, more and more weight. And it's just kind of like, you know, at the end of all of it, you know, things, things needed to change a bit. Um, and, you know, for example, you know, having that lack of, you know, job security. And it's like, yes, we, you know, I did get a three-year contract, but it was still a three-year contract. And even though you would get your three-year contract, um, there was a lot of like, well, the university is struggling with enrollment this year. And we don't know if we can give you that next year, or we don't know if we can give you that next semester, which creates a lot of stress. Then, you know, the pay, uh, you know, that that's always an issue. And, you know, granted, yes, we, you know, technically, you know, work for, you know, the, the nine months, if you consider the, you know, fall semester or, and, and the winter or spring semester. Um, but, but still, you know, as time goes on, it's like, when you start a career, you expect not to be at the highest level of pay. But, you know, after you are teaching for 10, 13 years, you know, you would like to see that trend upward a little bit more and maybe a little bit more quickly than what you initially started with. And also the workload. Um, so with teaching English, you know, there's a lot of paper, you know, there's drafts and journals and, um, you know, online discussion boards and, you know, where I'm not like the geography department or something like that, where I can maybe put something into a Scantron and, you know, have that yet, you know, it's like you have to touch all of that paper and look at all of those words, which takes time, lots and lots of time. Um, and sometimes you would get unpredictable work schedules, you know, it's like maybe one semester, I would have to go in three days, and then maybe the next semester, I would have to go in only two. Um, and, you know, it, it was just a lot, or, you know, maybe you would get one class at 10 in the morning, and then you know, you have a huge gap and, you know, then the last class that you're teaching is at five, um, which, you know, creates a lot of, you know, unbalance. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, maybe working nights as well as weekends to make sure that you can keep up with that workload and, you know, vice versa. So they, they kind of feed off of one another after a period of time too. And um, with me, I have a master's degree. So that really limited um, some of the opportunities that I had for advancement, um, as well as the type of classes that I could teach. So after a while, that just led to an incredible amount of repetition. And it's like, I like writing and I like teaching writing, but when you're doing the same class for the 50th time, um, that's a lot. <laughs> So, you know, just having a little bit more variety in terms of the tasks that you have to do, you know, um, that was getting more and more important to me. It's just to be able to do new things and, um, you know, explore new avenues of, you know, getting things together. So I'm trying to advance my slide. It is... Here we go. Um, so, as I said, you know, with with all of those factors, they weigh on they weighed on me over time. Um, so that meant, you know, trying to think of you know a new path and exactly what um, I wanted that to be. So it kind of led to this little Venn diagram of self reflection for me, <laughs> um, because. You know, you have on, you know, one hand, you think internally in terms of what exactly, you know, can I do, you know, like what exactly is that full scope and out of that full scope, you know, 
even though I can do it, it doesn't mean that I like to do it and I want it to be my career and I want it to be my every day. Um, so then you have that kind of consideration of what exactly do you enjoy doing and want to continue doing. Um, and then there is kind of the what am I qualified to do or maybe you know, how would other people, you know, would people look at my resume and maybe what I have done and achieved and see, you know, that qualification and, you know, what could I be able to prove with exactly, you know, what I had accomplished in terms of, you know, showing that I could complete, could complete a certain job or a certain task. So, you know, that was like a, just a whole lot of consideration and trying to find what fit exactly into the middle of, you know, that, that whole kind of complex there. So again, you know, this just took a little bit of self-reflection in terms of figuring out those, those next steps. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, when it came to assessing skills, this was a little bit of a challenge because with academic with academia we do so much and we don't realize all that we do on a day to day basis and um, you know thinking of that in terms of you know marketability and you know what exactly employers are looking for and um, what exactly you can you know present and argue for and show that you're good at. So, you know, there, there's a whole lot of things to consider here. And, you know, when you are kind of wiping that, you know, slate clean and thinking about that next step that you want to do, um, it's like, what exactly do you want to keep? And what exactly do you want to continue to, you know, hold on to and use to, you know, define that next step that you really want to take. So, you know, unfortunately, I can't, you know, provide that answer because, um, you know, I can answer that for me, but I can't answer that for everyone else. But, you know, just taking that time to really think about what you do, why you do it, and, you know, how much of a foundation do you think that that, you know, you want that to be a part of that next step that you take. So um, in kind of doing that reflection, I kind of, I came up with, you know, what I really liked about academia was, uh, or exactly what I was doing within that academic role is I like to write. And, you know, I like to research and I liked to learn. And I also liked, you know, the autonomy that you get too, because with a lot of the positions that I had, I, I saw my chair in August. And if it was a very good year, I wouldn't see her until next August. <laughs> Um, you know, with hardly anything in between, because, you know, you have your schedule, you have your classes, you, you know, you have your syllabus, you move through your syllabus and your objectives and everything like that. And you're, you're kind of your own little cottage industry and your own boss. And, you know, you just kind of um, plug away with, with all of those um, things. And, you know, I really like that aspect of just being able to take something and run with it and, you know, have, have that be it. Um, and also I liked, you know, designing curriculum too. So I like to, you know, just kind of think about, you know, what, what people need to know, how do you need to structure that? How do you need to present that? How do you present that clearly, like in logical steps so someone can pick it up and understand? Um, so that was very appealing to me too. And also still having some of those opportunities to collaborate. Um, and, you know, work with team members, you know, to have a good partnership, um, you know, to work on things to, you know, just refine them to where they need to be. Um, and, you know, that, that created a good environment. And I think, you know, some of the things that I developed were so much better because of that collaboration and those partnerships. So trying to keep that aspect was also good too. So I used some of those ideas to start my search. So, you know, I would 
I liked writing. So I would type in, you know, writing, editing, writer, creator, you know, what, whatever it was just in a job search and, you know, trying to see exactly what came up with that. And, um, you know, from there, you can then see exactly what comes up and use those results to, you know, refine your search and exactly what you're looking for. So, you know, with taking that writing track, I, you know, I also came up with new concepts um, that were maybe more non-academically based that, you know, I could use in, you know, that search going forward. So instead of, you know, writer and editor, you know, we had, you know, communications or content manager or content strategist um, or public relations. Um, so, or stakeholder relations sometimes was in there too. So, um, you know, you kind of take those words that you find and, you know, just continue to feed them, you know, back into your search and, you know, see exactly, you know, what, you know, jobs are out there, you know, how it aligns and all that sort of good stuff. And, you know, when it came to curriculum design, you know, I would type in words like instruction, objectives, learning, educator, and just see what comes up. And I, you know, learned of like on the business side of things, they have stuff called like instruction designers, where essentially you, you know, design trainings for their own internal employees. So it's like, what better way to use all of these academic, you know, teaching skills than essentially just kind of taking all that and running in a non-academic environment or, you know, an adult learning specialist, you know, that, that was um, a key term that I found too, that really helped me to, you know, refine um, some of, you know, my searches and just exactly what I was trying to put together too. And um, I used some of those main drawbacks that I was encountering in academia to set some important boundaries too, like, what was going to be that benchmark of pay that I was going to accept? Um, and, you know, if it was below that, throw the job out, you know, and keep looking. Um, you know, did it indicate that it would have irregular hours or to, you know, be available on nights and weekends or, you know, that there would be a lot of, you know, extensive travel or um, you were expected to work on a project until it was completed. Hint, hint, we kind of want to work. We want you to work around the clock till, you know, these main objectives are solved. Um, that isn't fun, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, I would throw jobs like that out. Um, and, you know, did the job have a limited or fixed term? I, I had 13 years of that. I wanted something more permanent and, um, you know, just something with much more security in it. And also just on a personal note, you know, you you are a person too, as, as well as an academic. So, um, Factoring in location was also important to me too, because, you know, I have a husband, um, you know, he, he works in central Michigan um, and, you know, he, you know, can't, I can't have him drive for two hours to his job either. So, you know, you kind of have to take those, ge I, I took those geographical elements um, into consideration as well. And in all of my searches, um, you know, the job market is weird. And, you know, granted, um, when I was doing a lot of my job searching, it was, you know, pre-COVID. Um, so I know things have maybe changed or evolved or, you know, just become much different, you know, since that time. And, um, you know, the job market, I, you know, I just wanted to take a few minutes to acknowledge the fact that it's work, you know, to find the uh, position that I had, I, I counted up all of, you know, the cover letters and stuff that I wrote, and I applied to 68 jobs over the course of two years. Um, and I applied to 18 jobs at the state of Michigan before I got an interview, and I applied to 22 jobs at the state of Michigan before I got hired. 
so you know they're they're you know it takes some trial and error to kind of figure out you know how to present yourself how to phrase things to get noticed um in order to kind of stand out above the crowd so it's kind of funny because i threw in these pictures of cows because i thought they were cute but um then when i was thinking about it it's like you know what you know we're all kind of standing in the herd and you want to like poke your head out and be noticed and you know have someone notice you back so kind of like the little you know cow in the middle there of you know just trying to be noticed and um see what's going on and you know all that sort of stuff so um and things can just be you know incredibly unfair to in that job market I mean, I was rejected from a job before I applied for it. I was, you know, rejected from jobs after I hit the submit button. I mean, you name it. And I could have been perfectly qualified for a job, you know, didn't get an interview, didn't hear anything. Um, you know, and I heard later from some hiring managers that when they put a job out, they may have, you know, 100 applicants, but they're, they'll just be like, oh, you know, give me the first 30 or, you know, give me every other one. And that can be totally a thing. So when you submit materials, it doesn't mean that they are actually seen by a person sometimes. Um, and, you know, again, there is some level of imperceptiveness too, because, you know, maybe they don't quite understand like, you know, how certain skills are scaffolded or in order to, you know, be able to, you know, write something or present something in this way, you have like all of these other skill sets that go underneath to support that. So of course you would be able to do something easier at a different level, but, you know, when, uh, you know, you just kind of present that one thing that you do, um, then, you know, it's just like, well, they, they showed this and what we want is that. So, you know, they have shown that you know, they're not directly showing that. So sometimes there's really that need to be, you know, absolutely concrete. Um, and it's a roller coaster, you know, just emotionally as, as well as with feedback too, because, you know, there would be some weeks where, you know, I would get two or three phone calls and then there would be a month where I had nothing. So you just have to be prepared for that and um, just, keep trying and, you know, keep trying to get as much feedback as you can to, you know, refine and, you know, kind of propel your search. And, um, you know, when it comes to refining that search, I know I kind of hit on some of these here before, but um, some of them I didn't, but, you know, when you're searching for positions and, you know, using those keywords, you know, using what you value, um, using what you still want to take from academia into some sort of different sphere or space, um, it leads you to potential employers. And, you know, sometimes they have, you know, their own, you know, job boards and postings. And, you know, it helps to, you know, maybe sign up for alerts, you know, for that place or, you know, to check in um, on their website on a weekly basis to, you um, make sure that you know you're not missing anything important or you know more resources or more opportunities um but that was kind of one of the ways that i found the state of michigan is um you know i've typed in some terms and you know these jobs kept coming up for the state of michigan that kind of seemed to align with that and i was like okay maybe this is something that I need to focus on more and put more energy in and, you know, just, you know, look at this as, you know, a bigger option because, um, you know, with the state of Michigan, even though I felt a little bit nuts um, applying, you know, to the same place, you know, 18 to 22 times, um, you know, to try to get any sort of feedback or somebody to look at and listen to me. Um, you know, everything goes to a different department things go to a different division, 
It doesn't mean that it's going to be the same hiring manager in all of those places and spaces. So you may feel nuts, but you know, it's a different audience, you know, seeing that every time. And whether it's at a state government level or even a federal level, it's kind of the same story. So again, different departments, you know, different hiring managers, different sets of eyes, different interpretations of skills. So, you know, it really helps to be persistent. And, um, you know, if you get rejected, you know, once or twice, just, you know, keep, keep going for it. Um, and as I said, you know, translating those academic based skills to a non academic industry just really takes some trial and error. Um, what I found was kind of a little bit of a game changer for me was to think in terms of kind of like quantity or production. Um, you know, so instead of saying that, you know, I would, you know, teach classes and mentor students, it would be more like I would teach, you know, eight classes in a year. And, you know, we did four assignments. And for the assignments, we had to do three drafts, which means that I had to read, you know, X amount of paper in this amount of time, you know, in order to, um, you know, just make sure to keep everything moving. And um, we would look at, or, you know, I, I would manage, you know, uh, 80 to 100 students, you know, per semester and um, things that, you know, just, uh, I, I tried to make things as tangible as possible. Um, and that seemed to be very helpful in, um, you know, just getting some traction and uh, getting my materials looked at more. Um, and then, you know, the potential employer may not fully understand or appreciate, again, how those skills or abilities are scaffolded. You know, as I mentioned for the previous slide, you know, sometimes you need to be very literal. Um, so for my current position, you know, as a communications representative, um, I kind of had a feeling uh, looking at the job posting that I would be writing press releases um, and certain, you know, external facing documents for the division. So before my interview, I actually had enough time to do a little bit of research on animal health and, you know, the state of Michigan. And, um, you know, I came across the topic of bovine tuberculosis and I found a recent article um, you know, explaining like some new aspect of bovine tuberculosis testing. And I actually kind of, you know, took that article, read it and wrote up a fake press release on, you know, announcing and presenting this information. And that really helped to kind of turn those tides. Am I running low on time, Gabby? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in here and say that I want to save a few minutes here for our Q&A. We have one question ready to go. Um, and we will be closing up the webinar at, at, in about five minutes here. Um, okay. So if, if, if you had a, a last thought, um, I'll let you wrap that up. But I, I do want to make sure we honor this question. Sure. Um, let me just see what I had on my next slide. Um, uh, I just a few other closing thoughts. So when it comes to seeking a position, it's not only about you, but also about the employer. So if you see, you know, red flags, um, you know, making impressions is a two way street. Um, so if something makes you uncomfortable or just makes you go like, well, that isn't cool, um, you know, feel free to, you know, kind of take a different direction on that. And, you know, sometimes we also need to prioritize our just own sustainability. Like if you want to continue your search, um, but, you know, you also need to be able to buy groceries. Obviously, you need to, you know, you know um, make sure that you can do that first. Um, and, you know, just kind of in this last slide here, I was highlighting how, you know, in the beginning, you know, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I had some degree of autonomy and there was collaboration and, um, you know, we would, I would still be, you know, be designing educational pieces and, you know, still writing. And I was able to pull all of those over and I still use those in my day-to-day -day position. So that is all. 
I really like this conclusion because it does summarize how you had set your values and your skills and like your boundaries, all these reflections that you had. And, and it's great to see that you were able to carry some of those into your position today. That's wonderful. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'll go ahead and read out the first question. It's from Jeremy. How do you evaluate the minimum pay criteria? Do you base it on the minimum amount you need to live, or is it based on how much your skill set is worth in the broader industry environment? I mean, that is certainly, you know, a good question um, to ask for me. Um, I didn't want to be paid at a lower rate than what I was currently at. Um, so with me, I just took exactly what you know, I was making and it's like, okay, if I had this rate over, um, you know, a 12 month period, as opposed to a nine month period with, you know, that, you know, whole contract work and how semesters go, you know, where would I be at? And um, for me, that was all I needed <laughs> is to be, you know, where I was at, but just in a space where maybe I would have more opportunities and be able to reach some of those other, you know, values and things that I wanted. So for me, it's not like, you know, I wanted the $80,000 job. I mean, that would be great. But what I really want is, you know, to get out and, you know, to have all these other things there too. So. I like that answer. It, it makes me realize sometimes we need to prioritize the values that we set because uh, you can't have everything. It, it feels like sometimes the job just doesn't exist for you that you get that 80 grand that you want, you get to live in the place that you want. So you, sometimes you have to pick and choose. Um, right. And that pay can come in different forms though, can we? If you have insurance, time off, pay, those are all some of the, um, the values that you accumulated when you were setting those boundaries, right? From mm -hmm. your past experiences. Um, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A, but I personally had one, which was if you can speak to any situation where you felt like your values might have changed, because um, it's certainly like we're complex people, and uh, you spend a, you spend a decade in one institution, you kind of you feel some change, right? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, when when you start, you just want to start, <laughs> and you want to you know be able to you know get that foothold and just. Um, you know, kind of grow and have that experience. Um, but when you want to make something your, you know, career and to make sure that that career is sustainable for you, you know, certain things just aren't going to cut it anymore. So it's just kind of like, as you involve, evolve and become, you know, a more seasoned professional, you know, you want to make sure that, in, well, at least for me, I wanted to make sure that my stability and pay and everything, you know, could match that. Um, because at the end of my 13 years, I was no more secure than what I was at day one. And that didn't cut it. That's a hard pass for me too. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to admit. Um, so with that, we are at 345, and this is the part where we will say goodbye to our, our public audience. We'll go ahead and close the recording, and I will say that we will be posting this recording on our project webpage, and we'll get the PowerPoint slides from you, Kaylee. We had some comments that people were very grateful for the diagram that you made, um, some, of the, some of the steps that you took. Uh, so we believe that'll be very helpful for people in the future. And, and thank you very much for sharing your story with us. I know it can be a very personal experience to share, like, you know, being denied something that, like, you really valued for a while. But then also, it's exciting to hear where you're at right now and that you found something that you, you truly enjoy doing at some point. Thank you for having me and happy to share. Yeah. All right. Uh, with that, I'll say... Goodbye to all of our, uh, our non-cohort folks. Uh, cohort folks, please do stay on. Um, we'll continue to have a private conversation with Kayleen, and we'll discuss the beginnings of our, uh, of our programming for you. So thank you very much. <laughs>